Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome club members and guests and our radio audience to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, President-elect, standing in for our president, Bill Lesh, who's out of the city. As is our custom, we'll start by welcoming new members in our audience today. I'll ask them to stand as I read their names. Please hold your applause until they're all introduced. Susan Ackerman, Assistant Counsel, Northwest Natural Gas. Linda Anderson, Customer Communication Supervisor, Pacific Power and Light. Sid Brown, President, Local Origination T Television Associates. Well, I murdered that one. Excuse me, Sid. Mary Beth Bushy, Assistant General Counsel, Portland General Corp. Jean Kemp Ware, Public Relations Director, Lewis and Clark College. Todd Oppenheimer, Contributing Writer, Willamette Week. Judy Lewis, President, Fred Penguin Productions. Pauline Pieter, President, Rain Drop Productions of Oregon. We'd like to give a special thanks to the recruiters, City Club members Carla Kelly, Colleen Littell, Ruth Hawks, Pamela Rapp, Tom Stanwood, Pete Hauser, Harold Hirsch, and Judy Le Lewis. Welcome. There are a few upcoming events I'd like to tell you about. Two open forums on the topic of community in our schools will be held. The first one is going to be next Wednesday from 7 to 9 p.m. at Portland Public Schools Administrative Headquarters. The second forum will be held the next week on Wednesday, March 14th at noon in conference rooms B and C on the 26th floor of the U.S. Bank Corp Tower. These forums are sponsored by City Club's Education Standing Committee. They're gonna feature some outstanding panelists who are well versed in all the issues around schools. You can get more information from your bulletin. The forums are free and open to all club members and the public. A week from today, our Friday program is featuring Dr. Zavin Kachaturian of the National Institute on Aging. He's a recognized expert on Alzheimer's disease, and he's bringing us the latest information and research. Please take note, this meeting's going to be held on the 41st floor of U.S. Bank Corp Tower. That's 111 Southwest 5th. We'll hope you'll join us there too. Our board host today is James Harris. He's seated at the head table. He's a member of the Board of Governors and an assistant vice president at First Interstate Bank. He'll have the privilege of asking the first question. After our speakers prepared remarks, we open the meeting to questions from club members in the audience. Preference is given to questions from the mic, but you might want to write a question too. Those forms are on the table, so write your questions and after the speech, hold them up and the staff will pick them up. Our topic today, Earth Day 1990, launching the decade of the environment. Are we ready to launch? Maybe so. This week, the Oregonian quoted U.S. Attorney General Dick Thornburg saying, environmental crimes will not be tolerated. On the other hand, maybe we're still in dry dock. The League of Conservation Voters released its scorecard this week. They report that Congress flunked its environmental midterms. At this point, you might ask, who's to judge? Perhaps former U.S. Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall has an idea. He said, over the long haul of life, it's the ecologists and not the bookkeepers of business who are the ultimate accountants. He made that comment in 1970, the year of the first Earth Day, a day 25 million Americans were heard and the U.S. took some monumental steps. The Environmental Protection Agency was created and enacted into law were the first clean air 
and clean water acts. Environmentalists, however, see that the advances of the 70s got lost in the 80s. They report that in 1980, our nation led in every renewable energy technology there was. But by the end of the decade, we led in none. From their perspective, the Council on Environmental Quality became ineffective and the Department of Energy stagnated. Now Earth Day 1990 is upon us. The issues have progressed geometrically. They're global now. Acid rain, the greenhouse effect, toxic waste, all demanding attention. Dennis Hayes, a founder of Earth Day, is City Club's speaker. In reading his resume, I found that besides being involved in Earth Day, he's also a practicing attorney and he's a lecturer at Stanford University School of Engineering. But three other things struck me. He's been a senior fellow at World Watch Institute, a visiting scholar at the Smithsonian, and he served on the National Petroleum Council. His credentials would seem to qualify him as one of Stuart Udall's ecologists and ultimate accountants. Today, he'll help us envision the environmental decade. Please join me in welcoming Dennis Hayes. Amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Mary. It's, it's wonderful to be back home. Uh, this is the part of the world that I grew up in and where my mother still lives, and to which I return with every opportunity that I get. It's great to see a bunch of old friends in the audience, including one who came up just before I began to speak, Janet Schaefer, whom I haven't seen in 20 years since she was the editor of the newsletter for the first Earth Day in 1970. It's hard sometimes to believe that it's been 20 years. 20 years since a new generation of American environmental activists strode up onto the stage and grabbed the microphone and began to demand sweeping changes in the way that America does business in the American way of life. As Mary said in her introductory remarks, the 25 million people who responded caused sweeping changes across the land. It was the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, to be sure, but also the Environmental Education Act, the defeat of the supersonic transport, the banning of DDT and other pesticides and carcinogenic herbicides. There was the effort to unseat a dirty dozen congressmen, which succeeded in unseating seven of them. It was a time in which things that had previously been thought almost impossible became instead almost unstoppable. We're in the midst of a big battle over the Clean Air Act of 1990 now. We had the Clean Air Act of 1970 then. It was a remarkable piece of legislation compared to previous Clean Air Acts. Many called it radical, though in retrospect it proved to be inadequate. But at the time it seemed far-reaching enough that it was strenuously opposed by the steel industry, the automobile industry, the electric utility industry, the coal industry, the oil industry as powerful a set of forces as you could mount against a single piece of legislation. I got a call once from a staffer of the Air and Water Pollution Subcommittee of the Senate Public Works Committee, popularly known as the Muskie Committee, where much of this legislation originated, and he said, you'll never believe who was just in my boss's office. The president of General Motors, and the president of Ford, and the president of Chrysler, and the chairman of American Motors. They were walking around arm in arm, calling on all of the members of the Senate committee, trying to stop this piece of legislation, an unsort of precedented exercise for Detroit to act with that kind of concert at that level to stop a bill. The Clean Air Act passed 99 to 1 in the Senate, 432 to 3 in the House of Representatives, a piece of legislation that would have stood no chance two years earlier became law overwhelmingly in 1970. And so it went for quite some time. 
At the end of the 70s, we found ourselves with a new set of environmental crises that grew out of the energy crisis. It was the Arab oil embargo of 73 and 74, the Iran-Iraq war in 78, that last doubling of oil prices up to $32 a barrel. And the nation committed itself in some fundamental ways to a major program in energy conservation and to renewable resource development. We did, as again Mary suggested, lead the world with regard to every single renewable energy resource in 1980. That upsweeping curve of environmental success then went through a point of inflection and became an S-curve instead. With the beginning of the 1980s, we found ourselves with a new administration that, frankly, was hostile to most of the achievements of the previous 10 years. James Watt, Ann Gorsuch, Jim Edwards, Ed Meese are words that have become sort of familiar to those in environmental constituencies as, if you will, the enemy. In case after case after case, they were on the side of eliminating or reducing to the point of virtually non-existence all environmental progress of the previous 10 years. During that period, instead of anticipating new problems and reaching out to address them meaningfully, the environmental movement increasingly found itself grasping by its fingernails to try to hold on to what it could of the progress of the previous 10 years and, and often, candidly, getting rolled. I, I was in the middle of some of those rolls. I ran something called the Federal Solar Energy Research Institute that doubled its budget every year for a few years, finally had $130 million, and they came in one day and took $100 million away. I had a staff that I'd recruited largely from academia, persuading professors to give up tenured professorships to come and join us. Those of you who are in academia know what it means to give up a guaranteed paycheck for the rest of your working life. To come and join what we characterize as a Manhattan Project for the good guys. A project that was out to do what the President of the United States in his famous Miao speech, you know, the moral equivalent of war speech, termed the most, crucial, the most crucial question, the most crucial issue facing this generation, the transition away from fossil fuels and fissile fuels into the efficient use of renewables. Staff of about 1,000 people, 500 of them were again fired overnight, given two weeks notice, no severance pay. It was done with a brutality that could only have been calculated to try to drive these experts out of that field permanently. It was not a good 10 years. And during that period, a bunch of new issues came up on the environmental horizon. Global warming, threats to the ozone layer, ocean pollution, rainforest destruction, temperate and tropical, vanishing species, which now are disappearing at the rate of about one an hour around the world, vast human population growth, growth in nuclear weapons. By any index that you can apply to that set of issues, the world is in a far worse shape today than it was in 1970. <coughs> and that leaves us in a position of asking why. What went wrong? What are the lessons that we can learn from that first valiant start of the modern American environmental movement and how can we best apply them now in 1990 as we try to do the same kind of a kickstart for a global environmental movement? Because that new array of issues that I just mentioned has one very important characteristic in common. It is that no one nation can solve any of them. In global warming, America now produces 24% of the world's carbon dioxide. At the end of this decade, we'll produce maybe 18% of the world's carbon dioxide. We can't solve global warming no matter what we do. If we were to stop burning fossil fuels today, 80% of global warming would continue. These are a set of issues that require international cooperation. And as we try to gear up an international environmental movement, we have to be informed by what happened over the last 20 years to our domestic movement. Where did we succeed and why? Where did we fail and why? Looking back 20 years, it's sometimes hard to remember the differences between then and now. We were coming out of the 60s, a decade of extraordinary activism in the civil rights arena, the anti-war arena, the early stirrings of the modern women's movement. Um, we're coming now out of the 80s, 
the me period, a period filled with ego gratification, BMWs, yuppies, and, and in shows like the lifestyles of the rich and famous, the lauding of greed as an objective, as something that you should strive toward as a validation of your personhood. I remember after the first Earth Day, one guy who worked in our mail room, who in many ways embodied many of the values of that period, um, realized something with a stunning blow that he was a grown-up now. The campaign was over, it was April 23rd, and he had to find a job. And the criterion that he used was he was trying to think of something that wouldn't hurt the world too much. And he reflected on his experiences in our mail room and decided he might become a mailman. Went down to the post office, picked up his civil service forms and began filling them out. Came inevitably to the question, do you favor the overthrow of the United States government by force, revolution, or violence? <laughs> and true to the temper of the 60s, he assumed it was a multiple choice. <laughs> And circled revolution. <laughs> Interestingly, this guy is now a United States senator. <laughs> it's been 20 years. We did some things wrong, and we might as well acknowledge them and see what we can learn from them. One thing that went wrong is something that we can't do much about. It is perhaps the most paralyzing fear that we have about environmental things, and that's that there were a lot of things that we just didn't know. We didn't know in 1970 that CFCs could destroy the ozone layer. It's not even deemed one of the issues on the board. It was the most stable set of compounds that were production of, of modern industrial chemistry. Wonderful compounds could be used for myriad purposes, and they had no negative side effects. They weren't mutagenic or carcinogenic. They weren't toxic. They weren't flammable, they weren't corrosive, they weren't explosive. They didn't do any of these things that had caused us to fear other chemicals. It wasn't until four years later that Sherwood Rowland down at the University of California at Irvine discovered in a laboratory that there was a theoretical way that these things could actually migrate over a very long period of time, 15 years on average, up to the stratosphere where some ultraviolet radiation might knock a chlorine atom off of a CFC molecule and the chlorine atom would begin catalyzing the destruction of ozone and that that process on average would continue for a hundred years and each chlorine atom would destroy a hundred thousand ozone molecules before it bumped into another chlorine atom or some other atom or molecule that it could bond with and form a new stable compound and stop the reaction. It wasn't until 1985 that we discovered the holes over Antarctica. Holes, you think of holes as little holes. We're talking a hole that is bigger than North America, a hole that last year spread over southern Australia and New Zealand with a 50% reduction in atmospheric ozone. Remember those numbers, 15 years, 15 years for a CFC to get up to the stratosphere where this happens. That means that at the time that the holes were discovered, all of the damage had been done by CFCs that were released before Earth Day. This year, everything that has happened to destroy the ozone layer is from CFCs that were released before 1974 when Sherwood Rowland first discovered that there was a theoretical possibility that this might happen. We got 15 years more of this stuff in the pipeline now going up there, and once it's up there, it's going to be there for a century, destroying ozone. It is a serious question, a legitimate question. What else there is out there like that that we don't know about? There are a bunch of things that we have high levels of uncertainty about. There are many things that we probably don't even know enough about to be uncertain. And it raises a really interesting question, which is where should the burden of proof lie among people who want to introduce new things or people who are skeptical about them? Should we have to prove that things are safe or should we have to prove that they are dangerous? Uh, granted the enormous perils now, I think increasingly that burden is going to be shifting in the years ahead and the people will have to prove that new fundamentally different products are safe before they can enter into global distribution. Another thing that has happened, and this is sort of controversial over the last 20 years, but I might as well lay it on the table because I think we need to grapple with it, is that we have shied away from some big, tough issues. The environmental community, for example, has largely stayed away from nuclear weapons and war in general, despite the fact that there is no greater threat to the global environment than a full-scale thermonuclear exchange. 
almost everything else, any other one issue, pales by comparison. But there's this thought, if you get into that issue, suddenly you're going to be alienating important segments of the society. You can't afford to jump into it because it's not really an environmental issue at all. I mean, that's a, that's a war issue. And, and then population as well. We really haven't come to terms with the population issue. Especially over the last 10 years as it's become much more fully charged with religious fundamentalism, with charges of racism, with countries in various parts of the world that we want as allies who are frankly trying to be in a breeding war with neighboring countries for power and authority in various parts of the world that we fear we'll alienate. We haven't jumped into the issue and, and come to terms with the fundamental fact that you can't solve the rest of the environmental problems if the population continues to explode. The world population has doubled since I was born, and assuming that I live out to my actuarial expectancy, it's going to double again, inevitably, before I die. Today, the latest best estimate that I've seen is that human beings consume 40% of the net biological productivity of the planet, with one more doubling that rate of species extinction from those species that are not competing effectively with us in biosystems around the world is going to move from its current rate, which is certainly the fastest since the evolution of Homo sapiens, to certainly by far the fastest ever in the history of the world, including reaching back to the age of the dinosaurs. We are facing a global calamity driven in large part by the demands that this one species is placing on the planet, and we can't shy away from that sort of issue and claim to be dealing comprehensively with the environment. We need to take a look at, for example, the leadership of other people in other social movements. Martin Luther King, who with extraordinary courage went into Riverside Church in New York one day in the mid-60s and gave a sermon condemning the war in Vietnam. And he was just torn apart by the American civil rights community. So that's not our issue. Our issue is racism, in particular Southern racism in the United States. We've got enough on our agenda with that without you alienating everybody that owns a flag, everyone who's a patriot, everyone who has lost a son in Southeast Asia. And Reverend King said, with his usual eloquence, that among all the young men in the United States, a disproportionate portion of African Americans were being drafted. And of all the people being drafted, a disproportionate share of African Americans were being sent to Southeast Asia. And of all the men sent to Southeast Asia, a disproportionate share of blacks were being sent to the front lines. And of all the young men being sent to the front lines, a disproportionate share of those who came home in body bags were black. Because there isn't any more fundamental civil right than the right to live to be an adult. Of course this is our issue, and we can't shy away from it. And similarly, the environmental movement has to leap onto all of those things that constitute major threats to the world's environment and say, we can't shy away from those. They're our issue. They are right at the center core of building a sustainable society. And finally, we've remained too insular, too narrow. The environmental movement today is a white, upper middle class, well-educated, politically active movement. Those, by and large, are not bad demographic characteristics for power in the United States, but it's too small to be able to stop someone who wants to roll us. It was not enough to save the Solar Energy Research Institute. It was not enough to save conservation budgets. It was not enough to save scores of epidemiological surveys that were shut down. It was not enough to ensure that Superfund was run well. It was not enough to win myriad battles. If we're to be successful in the years ahead, we have to reach out to constituencies that have not historically thought of themselves as environmentalists, to fishermen, to loggers. We need to reach out effectively to minority groups, to farmers. We need to pull in socially responsible businesses and organized labor and religion and say, these are the items on our agenda that we think should be relevant to you. And in return, tell us, what are the items on your agenda that you think should be relevant to us? And let's recognize that we're not always going to agree. We're going to fight you now and then. But on a great many things, we are going to agree. And let's work together on those, because the world needs us. We can't do this if we're all taught up in factions, and if instead of fighting battles, we fight wars. We haven't done enough of that. We need to do far more of it. And that's what Earth Day 1990 is really all about. After that first Earth Day in 1970, we had a factional battle. It was the battle between the lifestyle people and the political people. And frankly, they loathed one another. The lifestyle people were mostly folks who 
were purists and thought of politics as something incredibly dirty. Um, the political people were conceived of as a bunch of cigar smoke, tromping Neanderthals who would migrate to Washington, D.C. and closet themselves in smoke-filled rooms, engage in a process the whole purpose of which is compromise. And it's not possible to compromise, they felt, on issues that involve thresholds, on issues where if you cross that threshold, the world will be permanently impoverished. And things such as the vanishing of a species. I mean, it's gone. It's gone forever. You lose an acre of tropical rainforest and turn it into row crops and then degrade it into pasture land and then degrade it into desert. It's gone forever. You can't compromise on a threshold. And the political people similarly thought of the lifestyle people as a bunch of emigres from Haight-Ashbury with hippie outfits all wanting to migrate to a commune in New Hampshire and grow organic vegetables to lead lives of absolute purity and complete irrelevance. <laughs> And they fought for the soul of the environmental movement and the political folks won. And by and large, for 20 years, if you've been an environmentalist, you send 20 bucks, 50 bucks, 100 bucks once or twice a year to an environmental group. And it'll go back in Washington, D.C. and lobby Congress and intervene in regulatory rulemaking procedures and sue people and engage in electoral activity. But it was a false battle. You can't build a movement out of people who do not much more than sign checks. You can't transform society by depending upon government to be out there leading. We have to, if we're going to be a movement, lead ourselves. We have to live lives that are congruent with our own values. We can't solve any of those major issues that I was talking about without the government jumping in to solve them. I'm not in any sense here de denying the absolutely pivotal role of the political process. But I'm saying that it's not the be all and end all of what a movement is about. If there's anything that we can learn from organized religions, that we can learn from the successful social movements of the past. It's that you must not ask too little of your supporters. We take polls, surveys, focus groups across the United States today, and people are not asking what is to be done. They're asking, what can I do? And the answers are relatively clear. There are a huge number of things that we can do as individuals that in the aggregate have a huge amount of impact. You can recycle all your aluminum. Every three months, Americans throw away enough aluminum into their dumps to replace our entire aircraft fleet. Recycle the aluminum, it's not a tough thing to do. Extraordinary savings. Among other things, it saves 95% of the energy that's necessary to refine bauxite into aluminum. To recycle it takes only 5% as much. You can conserve energy. I mean, it would be really nice to have the federal government mandate fuel efficiency standards that began to get tight again after 10 years of having them staled. But whether they have fuel efficiency standards or not, there's no way that anyone is going to prohibit you from buying a more efficient vehicle and using it more efficiently. Or from insulating your house or putting in a more efficient furnace or putting a flow restrictor in your shower or doing any of the myriad things that you can do in your own lives to live more congruently with environmental values. And as you do it, you're going to make a greater commitment to these values. And as you do it, you're going to be able to proselytize more effectively to your friends and your neighbors because they're going to view you as a person of integrity. You're not just mouthing this stuff. You're living it. Again, looking for leadership to the civil rights movement. Of late, a great deal of attention has been paid to the anniversary of Rosa Parks' historic actions. Rosa Parks did not send a check to the NAACP and ask them to send some kind of a lobbyist down to lobby the local public utility commission to change the bus rules. She stood up, she walked from the back of the bus to the front of the bus, and she sat down and let the world adjust to that changed reality. The citizens of Atlanta, who were tired of being excluded from lunch counters across the country, decided they were going to move into those lunch counters and sit down. And if they got served, fine. If they didn't get served, they'd just stay sitting there till the end of the day and come back the next day and the next day and the next day until finally even Lester Maddox took the axe handle off his wall and began serving people. They did something different and let the world adjust to it and it increased their commitment to the issues and it changed things positively. There has never been a social movement with more things that you can do to exhibit your values than the environmental movement. Literally every choice that you make as a consumer, an investor, an employer, a parent, an educator, all can reflect their environmental impacts, all should be judged by their environmental impacts. So what should you do now, wrapping up? First, you should be part of Earth Day 1990 here in Oregon. 
You should, what does that mean? It, it means for those of you who have time to volunteer, you should get down there and volunteer. For those of you who have some kinds of institutional authority to pull some institutions behind it to turn out people for the event, do it. To the extent you've got clever ideas for new things that should be done, bring them. To the extent that you've got money to give, for heaven's sakes, contribute it. I, I used to feel very embarrassed about making that plea until Jesse Jackson grabbed me after one of these things and really shook me up. He says, you can't do it. You go out and talk to all these people and you never mention money. If you don't bring up money, you don't get anything done. The local group is a wonderful bunch of people who are in tight financial circumstances and can really profit from whatever generosity you can show toward them. This is an important event, and Portland is going to be a very important part of it. Second, we hope that increasingly you're going to find yourselves beginning to make the changes in your personal life that I've just been talking about. We have as part of the Earth Day campaign a green pledge that we're asking millions and millions of people around the world to sign. And we hope that we can persuade you to sign it and to live by it in the future. Third, a group of socially responsible investors and environmental leaders have come up with the Valdez Principles for Environmentally Responsible Corporate Behavior. If you're a corporate leader, we hope you'll review those principles and see whether you can sign on to it. If you feel that you can't, we hope that you'll reconsider. Uh, there's some pressure that's beginning to build. We now have $160 billion of investment capital behind the Valdez Principles, mostly from state pension funds, religious pension funds, city pension funds. We're now reaching out aggressively to an additional number of public pension funds, to labor union pension funds, to colleges and universities with their investment portfolios. And we want to do for the Valdez Principles and the environment what the Sullivan Principles have been doing for South Africa and the freedom of Nelson Mandela. It's been a proven effective strategy to get corporations to behave in ways that are congruent with the values that we all share, and we hope that it's going to be effective here as well. Next, after Earth Day, I'm going to be involved in an organization to create what we're calling the Green Seal. See, survey after survey that says anywhere from 75 to 85 percent of Americans want to buy environmentally responsible products, but they don't know what to buy. You got environment friendly this, earth friendly that, ozone friendly the other. I I take my shirts to a cleaners, and I've had a campaign going for years now to try to get that cleaners to give them back to me without being in a plastic bag. And I harass this poor young woman who deals with me, and I'm sure she just throws up her hands every morning when I come in there. <laughs> and finally I went in, and she was just so pleased she was bursting. She says, look at this, and she brings up my shirts. And they're in a plastic bag, but on the plastic bag it says, photodegradable, <laughs> biodegradable, and recyclable. Uh, I said to her, do you, you really want to recycle something that's going to photodegrade when it gets into the next product? And it was like I was speaking Swahili. I mean, you didn't have the faintest idea what I was talking about. But it's for those of you who think I'm speaking Swahili, there's a choice. You can be biodegradable or recyclable. You can't be both. But it's, it's this misuse of nomenclature that we're going to be buffeted with. There are all kinds of false claims coming out. And we need to have something that can be an objective standard that's an easy thing so you don't have to take consumer reports with you when you go grocery shopping. <laughs> and you can just run down the, the alley. You see 47 kinds of household detergents. I mean, I'm not sure why we need 47 kinds of detergents to begin with. But maybe three of them will have the green seal on it. And that might make the purchasing decision a little bit easier. It has to be done in a way that has integrity a way that is beyond any kind of question, but if we do it well, I think we can bring about a consumer revolution. The moment that we are currently facing is a critically important one for the future of the world. We, over the course of the next 10 years, will be facing some important thresholds. If we cross them, the world will be permanently impoverished. We have a unique opportunity that grows in part out of changes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe right now because much of what we need to do is going to be expensive and we have an administration that rules on the basis of a mantra, a president who chants, no new taxes, no new taxes, no new taxes. <laughs> and if you've got a really expensive program and no new taxes, you have to look at some existing programs and the only one that's as big, big and possibly changeable out there is the defense budget, $305 billion which has now been reduced all the way to $295 billion, <laughs> but may have some potential for future reductions if, in fact, we can count upon what's going on in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and I think we can. And that gives us, again, this unique opportunity now to begin to do the positive, constructive things necessary to build a sustainable society, a society with 
allows us to pass on to our own children at least as many options as those that we inherited from our parents. The moment is now. Earth Day is happening in an enormous way around the world. We currently have activities in 131 countries. We're expecting in excess of 200 million people to participate in the center of environmental activism here in the Pacific Northwest. I hope it's going to be some of the most spectacular, successful stuff that happens any place. But that depends on you. If it's to happen, it's going to be you, the leaders and the pillars of the community who make it happen. And for the sake of the planet, for the sake of your children, for the sake of those species that are vanishing at one an hour, don't have voices to come up here and appeal to you for themselves. And for your own sakes, as concerned progressive people who genuinely care about the future, please join us. Thank you. now time for our question and answer period. James Harris has the privilege of the first question. Jim. Thank you, Mary. Dennis, I checked our chicken and it is recyclable. <laughs> Dennis, you mentioned, <clears throat> Dennis mentioned uh, Environmentalists, environmentalists and non-environmentalists, that they, we need to get together and share our agendas and look at those things we agree upon and also look at those things that we cannot agree upon and sit down and start working toward some resolution or some dialogue. Dennis, who's going to make the first move? When are they going to make the first move? And when are we going to get on with it? Good question. In my view, the first moves have been made, and I think they're being made successfully, but they're only first moves. We've started, for example, a dialogue with a bunch of socially responsible industries over the Valdez principles. We've now got 40 or 50 companies that we're talking with on a regular basis trying to refine them. We're going to be doing the same sort of thing with the Green Seal to make sure that there's that kind of informed cooperation. And I, I think from some large part of the business establishment, there's a high degree of receptivity. In organized labor, we now have 11 large international labor unions that are supporting Earth Day. The very first contribution that we received for the campaign was from the United Auto Workers. Uh, I was in Detroit two weeks ago and put together a really major initiative there in an old Nike Zeus plant as their Earth Day project. The UAW, working with the EPA and with a bunch of black organizations in Detroit, are going out to this old field, which has been turned over to the federal government's Environmental Protection Agency from the Department of Defense and converting it from a Nike Zoo space into a nature area, it's sort of the ultimate uh, uh, swords into plowshares kind of movement, or swords into spotted owls kind of movement. <laughs> we, we, we have uh, a, a major program coming up with civil rights organizations uh, that is going to involve a, a series of fly arounds to different parts of the country that Jesse Jackson and I will be doing later this month. Uh, focusing attention upon issues where the environment is of particular relevance to African Americans. I mean, who is it that lives down gradient from the local toxic waste dump? Who is it that lives in the, the drift plume of the toxic incinerator? Who is it that's standing out in the fields when the planes fly over and spray the pesticides? I mean, it's the poorest, most disadvantaged parts of America, and they have a huge stake in these issues, and we need to enlist them. And in area after area, we are trying as part of this campaign to reach out effectively. And I, some places we've been reasonably successful. Organized religion, I think we've done reasonably well with. Just two weeks ago or three weeks ago, the Methodist Church mailed out 31,000 draft sermons to 31,000 ministers across the country to deliver on Earth Day, which happens to be a Sunday. And we've had strong support from the National Council of Churches and others as well. But these are all initial first steps. They have to be seized upon and capitalized upon nationally 
but where they really get implemented is locally. I mean, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen because you people make it happen, not because of what we try to do. I will try to talk in sound bites. I realize I'm being a little too garrulous here. Yes. Austin Leach, City Club member. You mentioned about the middle part of your presentation, the global population, as I recall, is about 5 billion at this time, and in your lifetime it would go to possibly 10. The consumers at that point then will be having a tremendous effect on our environment. I know there are many religious issues that are inferred in my question. Is there a possibility for Earth Day and other organizations to implement global Planned Parenthood? Well, to keep those increases from happening. I think it's at this stage, due to the structure of world population, impossible, no matter what anybody does, other than the opposite end, increasing the killing rate. Uh, there, there's no way to stop this next doubling from occurring. Um, the real question is whether we can have it occur in some fashion that leaves us with a structure thereafter where continued doublings will not happen, and an educational level that won't happen. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we can do that. Earth Day obviously can't implement it, but we're certainly strenuously advocating it. This is a very tough issue religiously. It's a tough issue ethnically. It's a tough issue in a great many regards. It's toughest in part because people don't have birth rates. None of you has ever had a birth rate, right? You have babies. You go, you have, you've, you've seen it. The mother comes in with her fourth child and every friend, oh, isn't it adorable? And it's the strongest set of positive reinforcements you can have. It even comes with the seventh child, with the ninth child. There's never a stage when you say, Matilda, that really makes me embarrassed. What are you doing having another kid? <laughs> yeah, we need to, at some point, begin to create that kind of a mentality. There's a point where it is a source of embarrassment. I mean, I'm having one child. That's all I'm going to have. Because I think the world can't afford for me to have more than one child and for a bunch of other people to have eight, nine, ten, eleven, particularly in developed countries where you're not worried about your old age. We've got social security and pension funds and other things to take care of you. It's just outrageous. And a terribly important part of this, though, is development in other parts of the world. If we're going to be able to achieve this in developing countries, we have to give some kind of security to people. We have to assure that they will be provided for in their later years with something other than survival of some fraction of their multitudes of children. And that will require a degree of political courage that we've not often experienced in the developed world. But we're certainly going to strive for it. Yes. Murray Polanyi, a member of the City Club. Dennis, I looked at the pledge behind you earlier. And of course, at the risk of being repetitive, I always look for something that says something about transportation. And it says, use efficient transportation. It seems to me that the problem is that in our country, we practically don't have alternatives. Mass transit, rail in between cities for passengers as well as for freight. I think that that's what we need. We need some alternatives. How can we get them? You know, besides more efficient cars, because the car has other problems besides fuel efficiency. It fosters sprawl. It fosters energy consumption beyond uh, consideration. So how can we get alternatives? OK. Well, I, I, will, I will ignore the easy part of the question, then, as to what kind of cars should we have. And that, that's only easy when you compare it to the rest of the question, which is just about impossible. Um, it has been argued, and I think persuasively, that the single most impressive index of the dysfunctional organization of society is the volume of transportation that's required. Which is to say, if you plan a city intelligently, you don't have to drive many, many miles from where you live to where you work to where you recreate to where you buy your food to where your children go to school. So transportation by itself should not be seen as a good. And the idea that a country is better off with more and more and more transportation as the years go by may in fact be the mere image of what we should be striving for. What we should be striving for are integrated, manageable communities strung together by transportation systems that are workable. What that requires is the toughest thing to find in American politics. It requires vision and courage. In Washington, D.C., um, we have a typical transportation system. It was designed initially for horses and carriages. 
converted to automobiles. It has a beltway, then it has another beltway, so it just goes out in concentric rings like an onion. Not at all designed for public transportation. And somebody with vision and courage put in a public transportation system, the DC Metro, a terrifically successful subway system by any kinds of conventional standards of how things should operate. But it wasn't designed for Washington, DC. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Except that once you installed the system, Washington, D.C. began to reorganize itself around it. And suddenly land values went up in parts that were close to the metro, and buildings got bigger, and people started moving toward it, and you started building neighborhoods around metro stops. And suddenly more and more and more people started using it. And Washington, D.C. is going to be a fundamentally different place 30 years from now because that system is there for them to grow around than it would be if it had. And we did the same thing earlier. We, we invested in the interstate freeway system, and America adjusted to that. And they can adjust to the other sorts of things as well. How do we do that? I mean, it, it's obviously enormously complex politically and otherwise. But within this broad, terribly boring term of sensible infrastructure development, which seems to be the way it's being characterized now, uh, I, I'm hopeful that we're going to be seeing the success of Washington and replicating it elsewhere, even in such places as Los Angeles, where it's almost unthinkable. Yes? Uh, Linda Peters, City Club member. And I guess it's all right to, to say that I am currently also a candidate for a local political office who is trying to exercise some of that courage and vision as, as far as uh, planning land use and transportation and economic development and so on around en environmental values. And, I, and from the perspective that I have right now, there are a couple of things that I'd like to invite you to comment on. One is the the great gap between the sort of moral or emotional willingness that a lot of people have to, to try to work our planning in a more environmentally sound direction and the actual uh, resources that we can bring to bear in terms of technology, in terms of funding sources, in terms of know-how on the part of our, our even our, our engineering firms, our, our existing uh, um, political culture, and so on, uh, how do we how do we go about bridging that gap so that the proposals that some of us make from the floor in meetings don't just meet with a sort of polite nod, but get translated into uh, actual workable parts of engineering studies that people can put their teeth into and go ahead and, and advance. By running good people for office and electing them. <laughs> I think that no, went it, full circle. <laughs> no, it, 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 ultimately, the people who pay the piper call the tune with regard to studies. Uh, I have seen studies sponsored by the electric utility industry that says that Acid rain is good for the soil because it restores depleted sulfur. <laughs> I've seen studies produced by the nuclear industry that suggest that operating a nuclear power plant is safer than running a health food store. Um, government funds an awful lot of studies. And if you've got the right people demanding what is to be studied, then you're going to get results that are answering the questions that are relevant. Um, one of the greatest things that has happened in the United States Congress was to set up the Office of Technology Assessment. Suddenly, we've now begun to have a whole bunch of studies that are not sponsored by governmental agencies that have a particular ax to grind, but are simply asking broad general questions from congressmen that want to know what's really the truth about this. And OTA, I think, has done an extraordinary job of, of really pulling that together. Um, and maybe you should have a, a local office of technology assessment, but at least get good people into your various elective offices to get the right kinds of studies done by the right, right firms. That's not a very satisfying answer, but it's the best I can do. Yes. Yeah. Marilyn McDonald, City Club member. Uh, Dennis, my question has to do with rewards and incentives. Uh, the problem is so monumental, so global, that people in this country, I, in this country specifically, are a me too or what's in it for me kind of a population. and. How do, how do we get the message across that there is something in it for us personally, that there's something in it for business and industry? Where are the rewards and the incentives? Let me answer at two levels. One is that we really need to have a pricing regime that sends the right kinds of signals to people. We are ultimately a market economy, and we've got all kinds of weird distortions in it. 
We have a, a price mechanism that was designed explicitly to try to open up a frontier economy. We were trying to figure out ways to encourage exploration and exploitation of the bountiful resources of a virgin country. And we did it exceedingly well with the right kinds of incentives. But now we've got things that discourage the transportation of recycled goods, that discourage energy conservation, that discourage all kinds of things. So we really need to realign those prices, and that's really an issue for governmental policy. For example, if you want to discourage global warming, what you need to do is have something that makes it more expensive to burn carbon in the, in the presence of oxygen, a carbon tax of some kind. Uh, if you really, and with public transportation, with any one of these issues, there are ways to send vastly different price signals to people that will encourage them to make decisions on their own. They can make different decisions if they want to, but the price signals are encouraging them to make decisions that are congruent with the public interest. A second sort of response to that in terms of motivating people to change themselves. This is something in which we have relatively little good social science that's been done, but such social science as exists has largely been paid for by people trying to sell products, and, and it, it's produced some interesting things. People very much want to do what people that they admire do, including celebrities. They pay a lot of attention to what celebrities do. That's why the lifestyles of the rich and famous, in my view, is such a catastrophic kind of show. It gets people who, in some senses, are admired, or even converts people who are despicable to give them some level of admiration, the <laughs> Donald Trumps of the world, and, and, and sets them up as role models. What we're going to try to do on Earth Day is, is to capitalize on that the other direction. We've got a bevy of stars of various kinds who are going to get up, and one place they'll do it is on a program on ABC that night, a two-hour special being paid for by Time Warner called the Earth Day Special, and talk about what they do in their own lives and what people who are trying to figure out what they should do in their lives can do as well. They'll, they'll do it with skits and humor and music and other things that make it prime time entertainment. But it'll carry a message that has some integrity because these are people who have done something different in their lives. And there are a great many of them who've jumped in the last few years and have made real commitments. Ted Danson puts 100,000 bucks of his own money a year into his own environmental group working on ocean pollution issues. Robert Redford has been in this stuff for the last 20 years, understands it, cares about it. Uh, Meryl Streep utterly devoted to environmental kinds of issues. And, and we're going to be tapping into some of that. Second, people want to do what their peers do. And if we can get hundreds of millions of people around the world identified with something, people are going to join just because they want to be part of that movement. It's the same sort of thing as we had with seatbelts. You know, five years ago, none of the people that I went to high school with wore seatbelts. Real men don't wear seatbelts. <laughs> Today, it's just flipped over. You got this tilt point in society, and you're a fool if you don't wear a seatbelt. We, we want to do that with a whole bunch of things. So you are sort of weird in the future if you don't recycle, instead of being sort of weird if you do. Yes? Just one quick re uh, reaction to that. If there's an incentive for business and industry to correct their pricing, uh, is that incentive going to be passed on in consumer pricing in your grand plan of things? Sure. I, I think that, that the price signals that everybody faces should be exactly the same in that regard. The great incentives in the business community, I think, are going to be consumer demand. I mean, if we get people wanting to buy the right things, that's all the incentive the business needs to manufacture the right things and to manufacture them in the right way. Yes. Paul Parker, City Club member. You made the point that uh, the environmental problem is very much an international issue, so I hope you'll forgive a deliberately parochial question. Oregon has an international reputation as an environmentally uh, concerned and active state. It's uh, one of the reasons that brought me to live here myself. Do you think that we're still earning that reputation, or are we living on our past achievements? Next question. <laughs> I'm I, I, I'm a little bit distant to be able to, to comment on, on Oregon in any comprehensive way. I do know some things that you're doing very well. I mean, clearly you got the reputation by being first off the blocks with a bottle bill and a bunch of other things where you really showed strenuous leadership early on. You've done, I think, some very interesting things with your transportation system here, at least as first steps as a major city. You've got a wonderful commercial and residential building conservation program going. It's, it's served as a model for a great many other cities. But beyond that, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm in a position to be able to comment, except that if you fly up here from San Francisco, the hills certainly don't look as beautifully wooded as they did when I used to fly up here in years past. Sir. 
Alan Oliver, City Club member. How do you assess the possibility or the desirability of forming an environmental political party, like in some of the European countries? Hmm. Ooh. Um, it, it certainly is less effective in our kind of a democracy than it is in a parliamentary democracy, where if you have a minority party, it gives you real clout, particularly if you have proportional representation in your electoral system. Uh, I, I guess I would love to see environmental concerns become dominant concerns of at least one of the major political parties in this country. Uh, I would probably say the best way to do that is to capture one of those parties for environmentalists. However, there are getting to be a number of very solid organizers, thoughtful political analysts, attractive candidates, and others who are beginning to articulate environmental concerns in a comprehensive way, ways that encompass issues of war and peace and social justice and business prosperity and, and other things that should be part of a vision of a future. Uh, in the past, green electoral politics in the United States has not always been practiced by the most sophisticated of political figures, and as a consequence, it's been a turn off in some instances more than a turn on. That may now be changing, and I think it's entirely possible that, that maybe in the years ahead we could see the same kind of major restructuring of American politics that has occasionally occurred in the past with the emergence of a new party and the disappearance of one of the old parties. It certainly isn't going to happen this year or in the next couple of years, but there is a huge tide of concern building of people who, who are holding this view that we now have reached a stage where we have to move beyond rhetoric. We have to move beyond simply giving speeches. We have to move beyond additional studies of the minutia of details with these issues. Say it's time to start moving. And if neither of the given political parties are willing to take the leadership, then I think a new political party will almost certainly be born. Yes. Oh. Carl Peterson, member. Uh, I was struck by your fact of 40% uh, of the Earth's uh, energy and whatever we have on the face of this globe being devoted to the human race. Uh, it has struck me for a number of years that a lot of these factors that we're looking at, whether it's global warming, um, extinction of species, or things are more like pulse taking, you know, vital sign indications. What's your blood pressure? Do you still breathe? Uh, can you stand? Sustain sustainability seems to be a key word in this, uh, more like our life expectancy that you also mentioned. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how to get that across? Uh, my feeling is that there's so many of these things that we're looking at, it becomes too complex for most of us to understand sustainability. Is that uh, something that we could push more? Well, indeed it is. And in fact, one way that you get that out is by attending the sustainability lecture series you're going to be having here at the City Club. I don't know if you're involved in that and we're setting me up, but I'll, I'll certainly give a plug for it. We, we have had in recent years something that has largely been ignored in the United States, but is of enormous importance globally, which is a project headed by the former Prime Minister of Norway, Gru Harlem Brundtland, whose name is sort of a household world, word in many countries who led a project having to do is called Our Common Future and, and led to the concept of sustainable development. It is now a very important part of development theory throughout the developing world. It's an important kind of concept winding its way through world bank reports and commercial banking uh, kinds of practices. And I think it's, it's of growing importance. Um, I mean, what's the alternative, right? If, if one side wants to claim we want to have a sustainable future, who wants to argue the other side? One, one final thought. We've come to the end of the time that I have, but on April 22nd, Earth Day here in Portland is going to be centered around the World Trade Center with a huge fair. There will be parades, there will be all sorts of things, and I hope that once again all of you will plug into the local Earth Day organization, become part of it, pick up the materials, for heaven's sakes make a contribution, whether it's financial or otherwise, and make sure that Earth Day here in Portland is something we can all be proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. We are adjourned.